Welcome to Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck. Join host Hugh Duffy as he takes you behind the scenes with successful accountants, CPAs, and industry elites in conversations about growing a more profitable business. This podcast has been to prove that accountant marketing truly does not suck and, in fact, can provide you with new skills to improve your effectiveness so you can learn how to develop a business that you want to run, not a business that's running you. Hello, and welcome to the Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Build Your Firm, an accounting marketing firm that was started back in 2003 and helps accountants to work smarter, not harder. I'm your host, Hugh Duffy, co-founder of Build Your Firm, and on today's show, we'll be talking to Michelle Golden, owner of 4LLC, which is a consulting firm for accounting firms that would like to price in advance of the work being done. I'd like to share some insights on Michelle Golden's great background, some of her accomplishments before launching into the podcast. Michelle graduated from Columbia College in Columbia, Missouri. Michelle has received nearly every accolade within the accounting industry. She's been recognized as the 10 most powerful women in accounting by Accounting Today. She's one of the 25 most powerful women in accounting by CPA Practice Advisor. She's one of the top 100 most influential people in accounting by Accounting Today. She's one of the top 25 thought leaders in public accounting by Accounting Today as well. She's also uh, recognized by the Association for Accounting Marketing in their Hall of Fame. Uh, let me give you a little bit more background uh, on our accomplishments. Prior to starting for LLC, Michelle was a partner at KCO Isom, which is a top 60 CPA firm formerly known as Kennedy & Co., serving as their growth leader from 2013 to 2017. Before that, Michelle ran a well-known consulting firm, Golden Practices, Inc., from 1999 to 2013, and she offered authored the Social Media Strategies book in 2011, published by Wiley, and has been known as the leader in social media marketing within the accounting industry. Prior to that, Michelle was the marketing director for a 400-person firm, law firm, and an 80-person CPA firm, which is kind of an interesting combination. Uh, and with that not-so-brief introduction, it is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Golden. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Hugh. It's an honor to be here with you um, and your listeners today. That introduction sure makes me sound old, <laughs> but thank you. But you're not. So. Right. I'm young, young and sprite. So, Michelle, in your words, can you paint a picture for our listeners about how you were helping the accounting industry with pricing in advance? Sure, absolutely. Um, I like to describe it as helping CPAs see themselves and their customers in a new way from their buyer's perspective. So I use a lot of stories and metaphors in my teaching, and I try and transport them to see the view of the buyer. Uh, I, I poke a little fun at the myopic way we in the accounting profession see ourselves and our firms. And I explain why we're so firm-centric, which is the core of the problem and, and the other problems with that, that that stem from it, and then show them how to bust out of that unhelpful paradigm, really. Um, I've created a pretty practical approach, my advanced pricing methods approach that helps them um, become increasingly better at understanding the customer and translating our firm-centric perspective to each unique cli client's perspective too. So it, it's really personal and it's really simple, but more importantly, it's very effective. Um, so you probably gathered that it's not really just about pricing. It's really about the whole relationship with the client. And what size CPA firms are you currently working with? You know, it's interesting. So for most of my career, I worked with smaller firms overall. Um, but for the last four to five years, I've worked mostly with pretty large firms, several in the top 100, some in the top 200. Before that, when it comes, and my work before was mostly in the marketing side of things. Um, before that, oh, the last five years, only smaller accounting firms had really ever attempted to institutionalize a model of pricing in advance. So a lot of the aspects of that, of assuming that new model are much easier in small firms than in large firms. Once I got acclimated to working in large firms with the model, um, and, and had gone through that experience with firms, including the one I worked in, that had actually started down the advanced pricing road 
about a decade ago. They were down that road partway before I ever joined the firm. Um, I got to see the the considerations in the larger firm arena and, um, you know, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, as I like to say. So it's really a cultural shift. And whether it's a large firm or a small firm, um, there are a lot of considerations to to take into play um, in making a shift. So uh, I am doing some public mini sessions that are, are good for smaller firms and individuals. But truthfully, I'm still trying to figure out the best ways to teach this concept broadly to smaller groups or individuals. Um, at the heart of, of my, my purpose in life, as it were, business life, I'm really trying to equip as many accountants with this how-to knowledge as possible because of the shifts coming to our industry from uh, technology and, um, you know, just efficiencies that we're gaining. Plus, I don't want to say threats, but, um, you know, the AICPA talks every single year about uh, changes, significant changes to both audit and tax. And with those changes are going to come needs to shift from pricing based on our inputs and hours to something else. And this could be that something else that works well for firms. For clarification purposes, you implemented this at uh, KKO ISOM or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I, when I joined KKO, um, I joined the firm as the growth leader and my role didn't include, I mean, my role included sort of uh, overseeing um, profitability and growth. Uh, and of course, pricing is a significant part of that. But I actually didn't touch or change the way that the firm had already started down the road of uh, implementing what I'll call value pricing that the prior managing partner had been inspired to do by uh, my friend and colleague at Verisage Institute named Ron Baker. And the firm had gone down a road with no formal training. Literally, it was the only top 100 firm on this path. And they had basically like taken a machete and gone through the jungle trying to figure out how to do it. There was no training. There was no precedent. There was no nothing to follow. So they had laid some really cool groundwork and had some hard lessons learned. It wasn't until I'd been with the firm for almost two years and... Frankly, my my managing partner had referred me to another firm that was larger than ours. It was um, significantly almost double the size of Keiko at the time, and I went into that firm. It's Horn LLC in uh, Jackson, out of Jackson, Mississippi. They have several locations. Um, that great firm brought me in before I started teaching Keiko anything, and I got the pleasure of working with Joey Havens and his team to um, institutionalize pricing in advance. So I worked with a firm, uh, a large firm bigger than my own before I brought this concept into my own firm. And uh, it was just phenomenal. So I, I formalized training, a full day program, and then I rolled that out to Horn, about 200 people. And then I rolled it out to about 250 at Keiko. And... Um, while I was with Keiko, I started working with another even larger firm that I'm, I'm not going to name today, but I haven't got their permission yet. And uh, by well, as of yesterday, when I flew home, I've taken a thousand people through my full day coursework. It's a day and a half now. And when you first did it at Keiko, was there uh, a contingent of folks that were resisting this ch change and transition? You know, it's kind of funny. I, I tell Joey Havens and, and my managing partner at Keiko, Jeff Wald, I told them both. It was actually easier to teach Horn, who had no exposure to these concepts and was starting, they were starting from square one of being traditional pricers, uh, base, or billers, hourly billers. At Keiko, they had already been going down the road of pricing in advance, but I was introducing some um, processes, some new processes for how to do it. Uh, I was taking them down a path of pricing with options, which is not something the firm had done before. And um, I mean, they sort of had, but sort of hadn't. Uh, and Keiko is a, a firm that works in the food and ag space, mostly agriculture. So much like the clientele, Keiko is a firm full of cowboys and cowboys like to do things their own way. So I wouldn't say I met with resistance, but I met with what's wrong with the way we're already doing it. Um, so it was it was a bigger challenge at Keiko, quite frankly. 
I gotcha. And and what is options? Options. It's it's really giving the client um, more than one choice of what to buy with you. So it changes the conversation from will I work with the firm, yes or no, to how will I work with the firm. Uh, there are numerous benefits to offering options, but one of my favorites, uh, aside from that whole competitive standpoint of will I changing the conversation from will I to how will I, another great benefit is a lot of what we sell is stuff people are forced to buy, compliance services. So when they're buying compliance services and they have to buy them, they don't feel like they have a sense of control. They are forced to, it's, you know, it's a given, you got them over a barrel, right? So the one thing, two things that they can exercise any control over at all. And whenever I ask a room full of people, this, they say price. And of course the, who you choose to work with. Those are the only two things you have a choice in. So by offering options of different packages of services, really different packages of solutions to the client you give them a chance to buy something. If if they have to make an investment with you at all, they can make the wisest investment. And it gives them like a stronger sense of choice and control that they otherwise lack. I, I, I liken it to, um, I had to buy a furnace for my home in St. Louis. My furnace went out in the middle of a really, really solid cold snap. It was below zero on Super Bowl Sunday, in fact. And um, my furnace was out and the guy said, you gotta, you gotta spring for a new one. Bad news, right? And, and the minimum price for a new furnace was going to be about 3,500. And, and then he told me, he goes, you know, a little bit more, if you invest a little bit more, you'll get more BTUs and a longer warranty, which wouldn't be the best decision if you're planning on selling your house soon, which I was considering. And then he said, and of course, um, the high, a higher end option would give you even more BTUs. It would have a much longer warranty, but the bigger benefit was it would qualify for back then. It was like a, um, an efficient, um, tax break, I, a, a efficient client appliance tax break. And that paid in part for the upgrade. So he turned my conversation from shoot, now I'm out a minimum of 3,500 bucks I wasn't planning to spend today to, well, if I drop five, I'll get, you know, 500 bucks back and it's a wise decision. So obviously I moved myself up the value curve as it were. So you were upsold. (laughs) <laughs> I was and it was the right decision because I stayed in the house long enough that a few winters with the better efficiency, lower heating bills, you know, um, yeah, it paid off. It was a good decision. But it, it, the, the better part was I went from being frustrated and annoyed with not the guy because it wasn't his fault. My furnace was out, but I started getting a choice and it changed my mindset about my purchase. That's a perfect example. Um Let's let's transition and move a little further down the path, um, and, and let's explain for our podcast listeners how is pricing in advance different than value pricing and fixed fee pricing, which you know sure. has been bantered around within the industry. But how is pricing in advance truly different? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the term pricing in advance to me that encompasses any method of pricing that is given up front, a price that's given up front and is guaranteed or certain. Um, it includes value pricing, which I, I I bristle a little bit with that term, and I'll explain why in a bit. Um, it's a very misused term today. Um, it includes worth based pricing, which is primarily what I teach people to aspire to. And it encompasses a true fixed fee price, which accountants do a little bit of, but not, but usually not. And the reason is that your fixed price shouldn't vary based on your time spent. And some often it does in accounting. So a worth based price, which I'm going to say instead of uh, is what I teach that's part of advanced pricing methods. It should be mutual. It meaning it should be worth it to the buyer and it should be worth it to the seller. So it means that the buyer deems the price worth spending because they know it in advance. The price is established collaboratively with the customer. And step one of that collaboration is to define their desired outcomes. And then step two is estimating the short-term and long-term gains 
both financial and emotional from achieving those outcomes. So the buyer agrees how much of their total gain they're going to invest, and the seller can then develop the proposal at or near that investment amount, right, which is called price-led costing. If I say, if, if we decide that it's worth it for you to invest $100,000 to gain a million, um, which seems pretty reasonable to most of us, then I have $100,000 to come back and look around at my brilliant colleagues, get in a room and say, gosh, for a hundred grand, how can I help you? And it's, it's a great conversation to have. And it's leading to tons of creativity in firms that are bringing more consulting services to, to the arena. So the, then that's the buyer side. The seller side is, is that I agree that the totality of all the work the defined work that I'm going to give is worth providing at that price. I use the term worth-based price instead of the problematic term value price. Um, I mentioned that it's it's used incorrectly, right? So the word value, number one, has acquired so much baggage. Customers are equating it with cheap. If you walk into Walmart, you see great value, you know, best value. Value, people believe the word value is cheap. And not that accountants, not that some of our prices should be as high as they are. Some of the stuff we charge for, we do charge too much, I think. But we don't want to be a Kmart or Walmart, right? Value pricing, the term too, is used incorrectly a lot. It's become really misunderstood. A lot of firms will tell me, oh yeah, we already value price, or they'll say we value bill. And what they mean is they do the work They sit back and at the end of it, they think about what the work is worth and they send out that bill. Well, that's not pricing. Pricing by definition happens in advance. And it's not an amount that's based on the buyer's sense of the value. The sole arbiter of a thing's worth is always the buyer. It's like, it's like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. If I have three stakeholders in a company, they will all have a varying sense of value of the work. They won't even agree among themselves, but they are the ones who have to decide whether it was worth it or not. Sellers cannot self-proclaim a value price because ascertaining true worth, it has to be a collaborative process with the buyer. And is there an optimal number of desired outcomes that you present to the buyer? Um, You know, it's interesting. Um, No, not really. Uh, It can vary so much. It really depends on where somebody is, like where a a business, a small business is or large businesses in their um, business life cycle, uh, what they're seeking to accomplish. Um, No, there's not really a formula or a set number. But what I will tell you is that when I use I use a case study in my class, and it's a different case study in almost every class. It tend, I, I like to teach um, groups that are industry um, specialists. So I like to pull all the construction people together and teach them together. So I'll use a construction case study. And when I do these case studies, they are not, um, they're not super, uh, they're, they're very realistic. They're not pumped up or anything. And when I bring a group of CPAs together, they come up with way more ideas than you could reasonably present to a client. So outcomes and ideas, um, the creativity is there. It's it's not really hard to figure out what outcomes you have with a customer if you have a a good conversation with them when you first meet them. And the dynamic that always surprises me is that CPA firms are used to pricing in advance for audit services, even large firms. Why do they struggle to provide the same approach for the balance of their services? Yeah, it's a, that's a fantastic question. You know, they, CPA firms think they price in advance for audit services and they, they kind of do with audits. Here's the thing. We've given audit prices up front for ages, but we often send a bill later meaning we undo what could have been a guaranteed price. So pricing our audits up front, unless it's actually guaranteed, we're not really pricing it up front. We're still adjusting to actual. I I use the term billing and ducking um, to describe when it is that we mail off a bill for overages. We sort of kind of duck, hoping the client will just pay rather than call and challenge it. And in that case, we've turned that upfront price into a mere estimate. And by the the prevalence 
with which we do that. Accountants have truly taught our buyers not to believe our estimates, um, that our estimates are low and they can't trust them, which totally erodes that trusted advisor thing. When, when you price in advance, you guarantee the certainty in price and you honor it. You maintain integrity, which is one of the traits that we in our profession love to claim. So that gets us to the struggle that you mentioned, which the real struggle is, how do I get my price right? And the classic concern when you're dealing with unknowns, especially like consultants where professionals are wondering, well, anything could happen. How can I possibly know what's going to come up? Um, to which I say, look, insurance companies have figured out how to be very profitable without knowing how many hurricanes are going to strike and where. Um, we have lawyers from uh, the Verisage Institute has many lawyers who are pricing even litigation in advance. This isn't impossible. It's just new. And, and that's what I'm teaching CPAs a process for, along with then like how to effectively position their offerings. Your example of insurance companies is amazing. I, <laughs> how they do it blows my yeah. mind. It's actuarial, I mean. right? So we don't need to hire actuaries to help price our, our work. But there's a point at which I could say, I will cover anything you need, Mr. Client, for a year for a million bucks. Right. I mean, but I would never charge that much and no one would spend that much, but there is a number. We just have to figure out what it is if you price that way. But I have alternatives. We can talk about that. And, and as our industry transitions from billing by the hour to pricing in advance, what are the pain points during this transition and where do they consistently and repeatedly drop the ball? Another uh, great question. So for risk management, the because that's the side we were just talking about, two key areas of skill growth need to be, one, defining scope, meaning what is the depth of our involvement and what are the buyer's responsibilities, and then coming up with good written scope parameters. And two, managing the project to the defined scope. In our profession, we have almost zero formal project management skill development in the firms that, that I work in today, even in big ones. Um, Horn is unique. They have several project managers, so they really understood the value of that. But getting firms to hire people with the, with credentials, there's project management institute, training, certification. I mean, project management's not just a checklist, and that's where we uh, struggle. The, on the firm-centric side of the coin, is focusing significantly more on the reasons for the work, those outcomes we were talking about, the purpose in the first place. And that's the client's perspective. We focus so much on our activities and inputs and thinking about, oh, what, how am I going to solve that problem? Um, Mahan Khalsa calls it, it calls us solutionists because we quickly jump to what's the solution and how am I going to do it that we gloss over or just kind of blow right past the purpose of our work with the clients. And when you price based on worth, you have to explore purpose with the buyer. And that requires some skill building as well. We don't necessarily all have the skills for how to get the customer to talk about purpose and worth. So some of the clients that you work with, are they hiring project management people or are they training existing you know, employees to um, acquire these skills? Yeah, I, it, you know, it's interesting. Um, Horn and the other firm I was talking about that was very, that's very large. They both already had some project management people on staff because they, some of their projects are very large and complex. And Horn already had, I believe, seven in place before I started working with them in 2014. Um, and they quickly actually, one of the project managers, the lead project manager in that firm is the person who, uh, um, what's the word that I want? <laughs> um, coordinated all of the pricing workshops that we led and, and held people accountable and things like that. So they really quickly understood how essential the project management piece was. Um, other firms that I've worked with, to my knowledge, have not gone out and specifically hired project management people um, to assist them in getting better at meeting their, their commitments to clients. And that's too much. My that's very much um, 
against my, my recommendations really is, is, you know, I mean, they're just like, Oh, okay, more overhead or whatever, but I'm telling you the, the effectiveness of it and the improvement in managing scope will more than pay for those people. And are there certain types of engagements that can't be priced in advance? Nope. (laughs) I don't think so. Like we're talking about the insurance company, right? You can price anything in advance. The key is that the looser your work plan, the looser your scope definition, the higher your price would need to be to offset the what ifs. And and if the price is super high, it's going to exceed a level that's comfortable for the buyer. So um, it's kind of more of an advanced concept that I teach for the consulting side of a practice. But we tend to use like a phased approach for complex projects or a, an approach that I will call cascading variables. So there are some methods to it um, that make sense. And um, the client doesn't expect you to have a crystal ball. Like think about litigation. If, if the, you know how to start a litigation, you can clearly define what the first several pieces are. And you can say that it'll be this much for this. By the end of this phase, we'll know more details about the subsequent phase. And I can say, because I'm a skilled litigator in this pretend moment, um, I can tell you what the five variables are going to be. And one of the variables is who the heck is opposing counsel. If we don't know yet, we don't know if it's somebody that I've worked with a ton and they're very honorable and fair and reasonable, or if it's the junkyard dog that's just going to bury you in in BS discovery, you know, send over 15 boxes of documents that aren't useful, but you have to go through. You just don't know. But once you know who it is, then you can make a better assessment for how complex the project is going to be. Hmm. Is is the legal industry further along in this process than the accounting industry? Um, only, well, no. Um, I'd say there are more lawyers that have undertaken it, but the lawyers who haven't are more resistant to the accountants. The lawyers, um, they are facing some of the same pressures. I'm seeing a huge uptick, and it's the reason I left Keiko Isom when I did. My intention was to stay with the firm for a few more years, but my phone started ringing off the hook last summer. Um, there's a huge uptick in firms wanting to talk about alternate pricing methods because of AI, um, data analytics, Lean Six Sigma, other efficiencies that they're building into their work. The, the efficiencies are eroding, quickly eroding the labor hours that hours times rate are the bulk of a firm's revenue. And if you think about, you know, field work and, and data analytics can chew, um, five, five hours of field work and turn it into 15 minute process, that's five hours of revenue they were counting on charging for. And if without having a, uh, concept of how are we going to charge if we don't use our hours um, and everything is getting faster and faster, what are we going to do? And and I mean, you know, could the firm still charge what they charged the prior year for the audit? Probably, but they're not comfortable doing it without some logic to tie it to. And they're so used to and ingrained in tying it to activities and inputs and efforts. Um, I I think that's the wrong thing to have ever tied it to. But that is what they've tied it to. And they're not comfortable charging for hours that aren't there. They feel like that's unethical. So they want to anchor their price to something different. And and how should a client of yours combat scope creep on an engagement? Mm, good question. So uh, there's a handful of techniques that, that I teach uh, regularly. One of them, uh, there's five. Um, universal price conditions. Um, you know, just what you put your, in your engagement letter, you already do some of this probably, but putting things like, you know, if, if tax laws change, we would come back and adjust our price. One that I've added in that's, that's kind of newer and a lot of people don't think of, but they always go, Oh yeah, nod their head is you need one in there for if key personnel turnover. Um, if the CFO leaves or the bookkeeper leaves, that's going to affect your scope. That's going to affect the involvement you have with that client. It's going to affect your, your activities. So that, that's something that I would build in. The second one is what I call basic scope parameters. Um, and I know journalists can relate to this. It's the who, the what, the where, the when, and the how of the engagement. 
Um, who's going to do what, what's going to be done? Where will it be done? Do, am I traveling to your place? Are you coming to mine? Are we doing it virtually? Um, when is it going to happen as a key one? Um, and how, so, um, you know, are, are we, are we doing what, how exactly are we doing it? What resources are we using? And that kind of a thing. So, um, we need to get better at specifying the most, um, risk, high risk areas among those and, and detailing that out for clients in advance and for our team. Our team needs to know clarity of scope. We have no clarity of scope today in our profession, none to speak of. What, what I say all the time to people is we say, I'll, I'll do all your tax work for $2,500. And what does the client think that includes? It includes everything. They're going to think, oh, it includes everything. Well, that's the default. And unless we state specifically what it doesn't include, they will think it includes everything. And you could have a runaway train, literally, because you haven't defined what it doesn't include. Even though in your mind, you're thinking of a few things it definitely doesn't include. You got to say it. Um, the third thing is pre-priced add-ons. I, I, um, I use a technique called add-ons very religiously. Um, you would have maybe three to five add-ons in a proposal and add-ons. There's two kinds. There's corrective add-ons that say like, um, uh, rescheduling field work with short notice, you know, will cost X dollars. So basically if you show up on Monday and feel and their PVC list isn't done, et cetera, you have the right to reschedule and you're going to charge them a, a price for that. Um, basically what it is, is you don't want the client to trigger that kind of an add on. You want to help them stay in budget, but they need to know what the consequence of not having their stuff done on time is going to be. And we never tell them what it's going to be. And CPAs will agree that clients rarely have their stuff ready for us. So, or in the condition it's supposed to be in. Um, the other kind of add on is like amazon.com where you buy something and you scroll down the page and it says people who bought this also bought. And so we can put in some extra sort of upsell type projects in there. And that's a pretty cool concept. The key there is pre-pricing add-ons. So if you have more than one round of changes to the trial balance after it's submitted, you could put X dollars per round of changes to the trial balance. That's what I mean by corrective. Um, the fourth thing is project management concepts, which are like detailed work plans, milestones, timelines, due dates, really detailing this out for yourself and the client. And then the fifth thing is after action reviews. And that's um, a process that we learn from. It's very simple. It doesn't take very long, but it's a military concept that you ask three questions. You ask, what did we expect to have happen? What actually happened? And why was it different? And if the why was it different is actionable, that like, hey, if we did this on every engagement, we would never have this problem again. I suggest we act on it. <laughs> so those are my those are my scope creep uh, tips for the day. That's awesome. And for your clients that have already made this transition with pricing in advance and have overcome some of the cultural evolution that we talked about, how else are you helping them improve their firm? Ah. Well, I don't want to mislead. Um, the firms who are transitioning are still midstream. This is a multi-year change for big firms. Um, if you, you've got more than a few dozen people, this is not something you're going to do in just one or two years. It's going to take years. Um, yeah, porn is on year four. Keiko's still learning and they're in year 10. Um, it's an evolution. Some, uh, there are some outcomes from applying these principles that were really surprising in a very delightful way to me. Um, some of the outcomes that that I'm seeing and improvements are much more careful and thoughtful client selection. Once you start working with a client and really exploring the purpose of the work and whatever, you start realizing other, you start looking at other clients that won't really have those conversations with you as much less enjoyable to work with. And I'm seeing firms bow out of some of those relationships, um, long ones and new ones, potential ones where a client won't um, engage with you about purpose. And then I'm seeing an increase in business advisor mentality. I'm seeing firms move team members to a business advisor mindset faster because they're thinking about outcomes. They're not just checking off boxes um, on, on their tasks. I'm seeing an increase of confidence in um, firms' worth 
or individuals' feelings of worth. I'm seeing people feel like, yeah, what I'm doing is worth this. It, I, I'm 100% sure it's worth this rather than kind of humming and hawing and writing everything down and pricing everything at break even, which I see tons of out there. Um, and the last thing, and it's the most exciting for me, I'm seeing in a re-engagement, I'm seeing people's passion for their chosen profession on the rise. I'm seeing a stronger connection to the purpose in our work. And, and the, it's coming from these richer relationships with clients and the ability to help them more than we've been helping them. I I love working with CPAs. You, you mentioned my law background. Lawyers are not as much fun for me as accountants because I think accountants went into what they do specifically to help others. Like they love it. They thrive on it. It, it lights them up. And you can't help people that much if you don't have really rich conversations with them. Are you saying that lawyers choose that profession not for the reason to help others? You know, I think lawyers, there's plenty of noble lawyers out there, especially those who are public defenders or go into, you know, family law, whatever. But if I'm completely honest with myself and you, I would say that there are a number of lawyers who go into the profession for money and prestige. Hmm. Interesting. You've got a better perspective than, than most would. Uh, let, let's take a little change in direction uh, and kind of do, uh, you know, uh, what if or, you know, your perspective on certain things. I mean, from an advertising and marketing perspective, you're clearly you know, an accomplished marketing person. That's that's the core of what you do. What CPA firms have done a top notch job, in your opinion? I mean, who's in your Hall of Fame? Oh, man, my Hall of Fame. I love it. Uh, I have to tell you, Beach Fleshman in Arizona and um, incredible branding, amazing strategic objectives. Um, I have some insights in, into that firm and and very impressed with them. Um, their CMO, um, their strategic leader also was at Freed Maxic and um, he left and went to Beach Fleshman and Freed Maxic has continued also on an incredible path. Um, they just do some really cool things. Horn, um, having worked closely with that organization, they they call they they call or the, what can I say? They aspire to be the wise firm. I love their alignment. Their internal and external focus um, is beautifully aligned, and I, I think they do great. Raymond, um, very holistic approaches. They've done some really cool stuff. Their um, outsourced accounting is phenomenal. Uh, their branding is brilliant. I love it. Aprio in Georgia, um, they've gone through renaming. They were HAW and, and there's a great article in Forbes that talks about their rename. Um, it's great. Uh, Gross Mendelssohn, um, a little smaller firm. Uh, I love what they do and they have an incredible Instagram feed. Love it. Uh, I think they do a terrific job. And then I have to say Keiko Isa, my former firm. Um, they are just ag specialists on steroids. They're among the top 100 firm and they're like a giant boutique focusing in food and ag and, and they do it well. They have products that, that they offer that no other accounting firm does. And, um, that's a great firm. Well, this has been great, Michelle. Uh, I'd really like to thank you for openly sharing your story, your perspective, um, what you've been through, where you're going with your new firm. And uh, it, it, it's been fabulous, fabulous sitting here listening to you. Um, for our listeners to learn more about Michelle, as well as for LLC, I encourage you strongly to go visit www.foreadvantage.com and learn more about what she's doing, where she's going, and how she might be able to help your firm. If you've enjoyed today's show, Help us get the word out by leaving a review in iTunes, ratings and reviews, and mentioning it to your accounting colleagues on social media. In closing, I'd like to thank Build Your Firm for creating and sponsoring the Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast. I'd also like to thank Liz Gold, um, who helps us do this. Uh, she's with Rhino Girl Media for encouraging us and me. She's obviously pushed me a little bit in this process to produce this podcast. Uh, that's everything, and uh, hopefully you join us next week. Goodbye.